Okay, thank you very much for enduring the 21st century technological momentary blips we've had. So what I want to do today is I really want to kind of guide you through a journey where we are, in a sense, many investigators, evolutionary biologists, fishes, are really changing our perceptions on the evolutionary relationships of wraith and fishes, which we heard in Francesc's talk, uh, compose about half of all living vertebrate species. So what I do in terms of my research, I use densely sampled phylogenetic hypotheses. Densely sampled meaning we try to sample all the species in a given clade to understand the mechanisms that generate the species diversity that characterize, the high species diversity that characterize many lineages of wraith and fishes. So for example, uh, we work in North America, sorry about the pixelation of this image, we work on the high species rich fauna of eastern North America, which is the most species rich non-tropical freshwater fish fauna on the planet, and to understand the geographic mechanisms that are generating biodiversity. We also use densely sampled phylogenetic hypotheses to study adaptive radiation, for example, in this marine clade of fishes that are endemic to the <laughs> southern ocean, the notothenioids. And then I'm also interested in mechanisms or methods to integrate the fossil record with information on living species, particularly their phylogenies inferred from molecular data, so that we could use the fossil record to time calibrate our molecular phylogenies. But what I'm going to talk about today is uh, an effort we uh, started about five years ago to investigate the phylogenetic relations of wraith and fishes, and more specifically, a little bit more of an exclusive group of wraith and fishes, the teleos fishes. And uh, just as no person is an island, certainly no uh, scientific researcher is an island either. And much of the work I'm talking uh, about today is a result of what I call this constellation of collaborators uh, from all over the world uh, that have contributed to various aspects of the research that I'll be talking about today. Unfortunately, uh, Brant Faircloth, if you're going to watch this video online someday, uh, I ran out of room, but you're here in spirit. So what I want to talk about uh, today is a clade of teleos fishes known as the acanthomorphs, acanthomorpha. And what I'm going to argue is that acanthomorphs really represent the final frontier of phylogenetics. Excuse me. They want me to log in. Uh, so uh, I don't need to read my email right now. Sorry about that. But they are the last frontier of, of vertebrate phylogenetics. In many respects, much of our understanding of the phylogeny of vertebrates, living vertebrate lineages, is pretty much resolved. Uh, there are some very hard phylogenetic problems in vertebrates, such as the very uh, dramatic differences in phylogeny we infer for groups like snakes and lizards between morphological and molecular data. And there's controversy about the placement of turtles among uh, the other lineages of amniotes. But really, the only group of vertebrates of which our primary phylogenetic information is dramatically lacking has been the acanthomorphs. Now, that's a, that's a pretty significant statement I'm making, and I just want to point out uh, probably one of the, the, the finest liter literary uh, figures to emerge from uh, the United States, Samuel Clemens, known as Mark Twain. He says, uh, basically, don't tell fish stories where people know you. I don't know many of you yet, so I'm in good, good hands. However, particularly don't tell them where they know the fish, and here I am at the Fish Space Symposium, uh, this wonderful database that knows everything we know about fishes. So uh, I'll, I'll tread lightly from here on. Now, if we think that there are about 63,000 species of vertebrates, just to give you an idea of how important acanthomorphs are, first of all, they're the most species-rich clade of vertebrates that no, most biologists have never even heard of, like acanthawada, acanthomorpha. 18,000 species of vertebrates are acanthomorphs. That's nearly one-third of all living vertebrate species are acanthomorph teleos. And they're diagnosed with nine morphological traits. So just even prior to the use of molecular information to infer the phylogenies of fishes, there was a, a pretty clear understanding by the early 1970s that acanthomorphs were a clade primarily from these nine morphological characters. And 
are kind of, uh, just to kind of place the acanthomorphs in the general Rafin fish phylogeny, the Axenopterygian phylogeny, what I'm doing here is I'm showing you a, a phylogeny that's calibrated to time. So here's the geologic record on, on the left here. And here are the major clades of Rafin fishes where the branches correspond to the age estimates. Okay? Now this is a phylogeny that was inferred from DNA sequences of 10 nuclear protein coding genes. And here I'm listing just the clade names with the species diversity in each clade. And so you can see here are raffin fishes. All but 50 species of raffin fishes are teleos fishes. And then coming up here, we have the acanthomorphs with the 18,000 species, 18,100, and about 50 now. And then I'll also mention another clade that's nested within the acanthomorpha, that is the percomorpha. So most acanthomorphs are percomorphs, all right? Now, there's a few lineages of non-percomorph acanthomorphs. They're actually really interesting lineages. For example, Polymyxia, the beardfish, is an example of a non-percomorph acanthomorph. And much of our information about the early evolutionary history of acanthomorphs come from the fossil record that I'll talk a little bit about today that primarily involves these non-percomorph acanthomorphs. Now, acanthomorphs uh, are this not only incredibly species-rich clade, but if you went and asked your average person on the street to close their eyes and envision a fish, uh, most of them are going to think of an acanthomorph teleost. At least in the United States, uh, we're not a big fish-eating culture, uh, but the vast majority of fish we do eat in the United States, other than salmon and catfishes, essentially are all acan are acanthomorph teleost. And even in kind of pop culture, uh, Finding Nemo, uh, of course, was an acanthomorph teleost. So what we see with the acanthomorphs is not just this rich species diversity, but also this incredible ecological and morphological diversity. And that, in a sense, you could almost think, in terms of ray fin fishes, with regards to kind of the morphospace occupied, there's such a wide range of morphospace occupied by acanthomorph teleost. Now, this slide is not a joke, and that is... Uh, prior to the application of molecular methods, this essentially was our understanding of the phylogeny of the major lineages of acanthomorphs. And for those of you who may not be familiar with interpreting phylogenies, we hope that phylogenies are bifurcating, where we have a common ancestral inferred node with two descendant lineages. And what phylogeneticists hate to see Does anyone happen to know how to terminate this? Okay. Ah, I know. One moment. That'll do it. So what phylogeneticists really do not like to see is where you have more than one branch emanating from a node. We call these polytomies. And you can see here is basically a whole forest of polytomies where it's basically saying we have no working hypothesis as to how all of these major lineages are related to each other. Now, the application of molecular data to resolving this acanthomorph problem has a pretty rich and deep history, and I'm just showing you kind of a broad snapshot of efforts uh, uh, previous efforts to attack the problem of acanthomorph and percomorph phylogeny using molecular data. And from these efforts, a number of fairly unexpected results have emerged. Now, these results have emerged across various different studies utilizing different data sets, different samples of the genome. And in fact, even with our approaching of utilizing next-generation phylogenomics, these results are being verified uh, in these more current studies. So one of the first unexpected results was that the angler fishes, the Lophia forms, are actually the sister lineage of the puffer fishes, the tetrodontiformes. Now, to put this into a phylogenetic perspective, if we had our previous understanding of acanthomorph phylogeny, Lophia forms were in this group called the Paracanthopterygii. So the analogy to mammal phylogenetics of 
moving lophiiforms to the sister clade of tetradoniforms would be saying that, well, let's say the marsupial opossums are actually the sister lineage of the primates. That is, you basically have to transcend the common ancestor of placental uh, and marsupial mammals to alter that phylogenetic tree. That's what we did here, utilizing molecular data. We've actually took a group that we thought, two groups that were dramatically divergent phylogenetically, and this molecular data consistently resolves them as a clade. And now there's subsequent <coughs> morphological studies that are finding morphological characteristics that are in common between lophiiforms and the tetradoniforms. Another unexpected result is the fact that the old scombroidii, that is the clade that contained the tunas and the billfishes, such as your marlins, are actually quite distantly related from each other. And so here we have kind of the classic arrangement where tunas and billfishes would be classified together in the same uh, taxonomic group. But yet, as you can see here on the broad acanthomorph molecular phylogeny, they actually resolve in really uh, distantly related lineages. And in fact, we find that the billfishes are actually in this odd clade that I'll mention again later called the Corangomorpha that also includes the flatfishes, the barracudas, and the Jackson pompanos, your corangids. Now, another interesting result was we were able to delimit this whole new clade that no one had ever anticipated before that we call Ovalentaria. And this is an important clade. It contains about 4,800 species comprising 40 different taxonomic families. It's more than 25% of all living species of percomorphs, and it's 16% of all species of raven fishes. So what's in Ovalentaria? Well, only some of the most iconic and important groups of fishes with regard to economic importance and scientific importance. So for example, we have the hyperspecies-rich clades, the blennies, and the cichlids are in this clade, as well as the very species-rich atherinomorpha, a very uh, important group of organisms for scientific and particularly atherinomorphs and cichlids for, for the pet trade as well, that all of these lineages are sharing common ancestry. And they're delimited here in this clade colored green. Now, in particular, with cichlid fishes, we all know not only are cichlid species rich, but they're this really interesting model organism for understanding several aspects of evolutionary biology, including the generation of biodiversity, the evolution of reproductive isolation, the role of behavior in uh, reproductive isolation. And a long-standing mystery has been, what are cichlids related to? And specifically, what is the sister lineage to cichlids? So if we have an idea of the sister lineage of cichlids, we could then understand potentially the evolutionary changes and how those evolutionary changes happened that make cichlids the special clade of fishes that they are. Well, consistently, again and again, our molecular data sets are resolving this bizarre, enigmatic, species-poor lineage called Pholodichthys as the sister lineage to cichlids. And here's Pholodichthys. It's called the engineer goby. And it's a, it's a, it's a Percomorph teleos that has evolved an eel-like morphology that uh, basically has two aloe species in the coral triangle. It's fully marine. And no one would have ever anticipated that this kind of species-poor marine lineage would resolve as a sister lineage of the cichlids. But again and again, this result is verified. <clears throat> So where we're at today is this problem of not understanding the phylogeny of acanthomorphs. We are reaching a point of resolution. And several researcher groups are contributing to this uh, problem in significant ways. But what I want to talk about today is talked a little bit about the phylogenetic relationships of acanthomorphs. But I want to ask questions about the temporal patterns of acanthomorph diversification. That is two ways. Has the rate of biodiversity generation in acanthomorphs changed through time? And then also, it, are there signatures where different groups of acanthomorphs seem to be generating more biodiversity than others? So it's two ways of thinking about lineage diversification rates. We could think about it, the rates changing in time, through time globally for all acanthomorphs, 
Then we'll ask questions, are our specific acanthomorph lineages, in a sense, diversifying faster or slower than other clades of acanthomorphs? And then I'll finish off today by talking about some of our uh, preliminary forays into phylogen phylogenomic approaches for inferring the phylogeny of acanthomorph teleoster. So first, phylogenetic relationships. Our initial efforts <clears throat> are, had utilized a data set of 10 nuclear genes, protein coding nuclear genes. We sampled about 580 species. We had comprised 231 taxonomic families. The data matrix is complete, 85% complete, meaning there's only 15% missing data. So for a large phylogenetic data set of this size with this many species and this many genes, this is actually quite a remarkable degree of, of, of completion. Uh, there are other efforts out there where the data matrix is about 42% complete or so. And we did fairly standard maximum likelihood phylogeny inference, as well as utilizing a Bayesian relaxed clock analysis to time calibrate our phylogeny. Now, where we're at today with the same data set, we're up to about 1,500 acanthomorph species. We have all but three percomorph families sampled. So any family of acanthomorph teleos that you can think of, we have now sampled except for these three, uh, despite our efforts, are still eluding uh, incorporation. And again, our data matrix is still, uh, completion is fairly high. Now, when we, Infer the phylogeny, what we're finding is that it's not only is the phylogeny well resolved, we don't have a lot of those polytomies that kind of uh, characterize the pre-molecular thinking of phy phylogenetics of acanthomorphs. Most of the nodes are uh, well supported, they have high bootstrap values, so given uh, our data, the data has a lot of signal to resolve these relationships. And within the percomorphs, we resolve 14 major clades that we think of in a rank-free kind of uh, uh, approach. Now, I realize moving away from a Linnaean classification would be uh, tantamount to uh, treason here in Sweden, uh, but uh, there's just too many groups of these fishes to fit them all into kind of these classic Linnaean hierarchical ranks. Now, with regard to the major lineage of the Canthomorphs, this is essentially uh, the relationships we infer and this is calibrated to time here. The bars represent the credible interval on the age estimates. And these are essentially all of the non-percomorph acanthomorph lineages. And here are all the percomorphs kind of collapsed into one branch. And there's essentially one node here that we don't have strong support for. And interestingly enough, this is a node that involves the lampreforms, the opas, and the ore fishes of which from previous morphological analyses were hypothesized to be the sister lineage of all other acanthomorphs. So even though we don't have strong support for that, its placement right there, we can definitely reject that it is the earliest diverging lineage of acanthomorphs with our data. Now, with regard to unexpected relationships, we, we resolve all of these unexpected relationships again with our data set. In fact, uh, one of the unexpected relationships emerging from this is that the clade that contains the tunas is actually the sister lineage to the clade that contains the crunchy seahorses. So you could think about the, that next time you're eating your sashimi, that uh, the common ancestor of this large inclusive clade uh, contains the tunas as well as the seahorses. Relative uh, to that, in the seahorse clade, we find the goatfishes, the mullids, which had been bounced around the percomorph classification for decades are finding resolution in a clade that contains the seahorses, as well as the dragonets, uh, the calamides, calamides. All right, well, let's talk about temporal aspects of diversification. And so, again, we're talking about if we take slices through time, have there been changes in the global rate of lineage diversification of acanthomorphs? And what I'm trying to say is, like, have there been periods where They've had really high speciation rates and periods where speciation rates have been lower. And then we'll also take an approach where we're comparing clades of acanthomorphs, asking are some clades have higher rates of diversification than others. So what we did is we took this initial sampling of about 580 species. We applied three, 37 well-justified fossil calibration 
uh, priors to our analysis. We did a Bayesian analysis using a relaxed molecular clock. We ran this for about 1.2 billion generations, and we actually ran an analysis for one year with eight processors, so we have more than eight years of computational time uh, on this one analysis. We felt like we were launching a satellite to Mars before we started this analysis to make sure we had it all right. So we could look at these uh, phylogenies where they're color-coded. So where speciation rates are high, they're red, and where speciation rates are, or the branches are blue, speciation rates, diversification rates are slower. And so we can ask, are diversification rates kind of gradually changing, or are these abrupt changes in diversification rate through the history of acanthomorphs? And where we may expect uh, the latter here, where there are these abrupt changes, are uh, patterns what we look at the fossil record. So if we look at the fossil record of squamates, which are your lizards and snakes, we see a, at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, we see a dramatic change of the fauna, where many, many older lineages, so here we are in the Cretaceous, here we're coming into the Paleogene in the Cenozoic, we see the turnover where many lineages go extinct at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, just like the dinosaurs. And in fact, this pattern in the fossil record is often invoked as a mechanism for biodiversity generation. So where we see kind of this extinction of squamate lineages in the fossil record and the extinction of dinosaurs in the fossil record, it's argued that uh, this then opened up niches for the evolution of arclade, the placental mammals. So what we have here is a phylogeny of mammals, and here we have the, the placental mammals. This is where we live in the tree of life. And here we have the Cretaceous Cenozoic, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, is argued to be a time of the origin of all the major clades of placental mammals. That is just reading the fossil record uh, uh, directly. And in fact, this is uh, invoked as a mechanism of biodiversity generation in a paper that just came out last year in Science Magazine, where they argue their time tree has all of the placental mammals diversifying at the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. So there may be uh, uh, reasons that we may expect a gra or, or, or kind of a punctuated change in lineage diversification. So the way we'll go about this is basically we're going to take the phylogeny and do slices through various points in time, and what we'll be able to do is estimate the diversification rate and see if there are changes through time in that lineage diversification rate. So here's the lineage diversification rate and here's the time before present. So we're just taking slices in the phylogeny and seeing if the diversification rate changes or not. And this approach we took, this birth death shift approach, gives us a nice iterative approach for differential model fitting. So it's really flexible to uh, different evolutionary scenarios. Now, when this was first developed, it was applied to the mammal problem using a time calibrated phylogeny of mammals. And so we here have the diversification rate of mammals going through time, and the red dotted line here shows the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And as you can see, there is no inferred change of lineage diversification rate, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, but there's a dramatic increase in the placental mammal diversification rate near the Oligocene-Miocene boundary, uh, which, by the way, correlates with uh, different uh, paleoclimatic and paleogeographic um, uh, changes to Earth. So they correlate this increase in diversification rate in placental mammal clades well after the origin of the placental mammals and, and show that there's no change in placental mammal diversification rate as you cross the paleo uh, gene or Cretaceous paleogene boundary. Now with Acanthomorph teleos, we don't really know what to expect. And the problem is there are, what I'm showing you here is a geologic time scale various fossil formations of teleos fishes, and those formations that contain acanthomorph teleos are in the blue boxes. So as you can see, as you approach the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary here at about 66 million years, there are no really good formations. There are no formations that we can utilize to kind of have uh, uh, an inference from the, the paleontological record. 
So what we have here are kind of these species poor lineages that have a lot of the non-percomorph uh, acanthomorphs. And then as you come over here, you get to like the famous um, uh, formations in Italy, uh, uh, Monte Bolca, for example, where essentially almost all of the major lineages of reef fish clades that are alive today are present in the fossil record there. So there seems to be uh, a really dramatic difference as you cross the Paleogene or the, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, but we have no real good formations at that time period. So uh, again, I'm really sorry about how this uh, image has been pixelated. So uh, fortunately, the important part is uh, you can see. So all I'm showing you here is that same time calibrated phylogeny. So here we have the acanthomorphs, then we have the percomorphs. And what I'm showing you here then is the ages of these clades as estimated in millions of years. And what this blue line represents is the mean uh, diversification rate estimate across a sample of like 1,000 or 5,000 Bayesian posterior trees. I forgot the exact value. And then what the red lines are showing are the diversification rate estimates across those individual trees. So you could think about this being the credible interval of the diversification rate estimate in red, and in blue is the diversification rate estimate of that, uh, from that summarized tree. So what we could see is that as we cross the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary, there's no change in the lineage diversification rate, but there's a dramatic decrease in the diversification rate of acanthomorphs at about 50 million years ago, some point in the Eocene. Now, what's interesting is if we uh, marry this observation to uh, morphological data from fossil fish specimens from these different formations that was put together by Matt Friedman, who's at University of Oxford in the UK, and what each of these lines is showing is the mean value of morphological disparity of all the species from the fossil formations in this time period. And what Matt's work showed was that as you cross the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary, looking at the morphology of these fossil fishes, you have a dramatic increase in morphological disparity, and then morphological disparity just kind of hovers along. doesn't really change very much. It looks like it's going down there in the Miocene, but those are not significant differences. The only significant difference is from this latest Cretaceous to this earliest Paleogene fossil records. Okay? So even though we're not seeing a change in lineage diversification rate, it's interesting that where the diversification rate starts going down is when morphological disparity is at its peak. And so what this indicates is this could, we could expect this uh, if we, we think about adaptive radiation theory. As lineages diversify morphologically and ecologically and fill niches, it's expected that both rates of lineage diversification as well as rates of ecological and morph morphological disparity will slow down. And so maybe what we're seeing here is the result of this adaptive radiation of acanthomorph teleost, where morphological disparity increases, and among the living lineages, we're seeing this associated decrease in the lineage diversification rate. So what we're arguing is the paleogene, this time period, just following the Cretaceous, Maybe the zenith, maybe the, the, the point where acanthomorph teleost were really at their best in terms of mechanisms such as adaptive radiation. That is at least among the major lineages. Now, the other way we could think about lineage diversification rate is actually comparing different clades. So, for example, among all the living archosaurs, we have the crocodilians and the birds. Which of the two is more species rich? The birds, right. There's 10,000 species of birds and what, maybe 20 or so species of crocodilians, and they share common ancestry relative to all living organisms. That becomes an interesting question. Why is there only 20 in one clade and 10,000 in the other? And so what we're asking now, are there significant changes among clades with regard to their lineage diversification rate? So we're not looking through time, we're doing a clade-by-clade -clade comparison. Now, in order to do this, we utilized uh, a method developed by one of our collaborators, Michael Faro and Luke Harmon, as well as my former graduate student, Alex Dornberg. 
And what this involves is basically fitting different diversification rate models to time-calibrated phylogenies where you know the species diversity at the tips. So the nice thing about this method is you don't need to sample every species in order to include an estimate of its diversity in the analysis. So even if you have only sampled 50 cichlids, you could say, well, fish base tells me there's 1,680 species of cichlids, and you could utilize that estimate in your analysis. And basically what it allows you to do is identify where in the phylogeny there are significant changes in the lineage diversification rate, both high and low, and it estimates a relative background diversification rate for the entire clade that you sampled in, this, in the most inclusive part of your phylogeny. And this is uh, from the paper that described the method. It's called MEDUSA, Modeling Evolutionary Diversification Using Stepwise AIC. And what they're showing you here is where they detect shifts in lineage diversification. So they found a shift leading to the Osteophysian freshwater teleost clade. They found a shift leading to the Porcomorse to high rates in both instances. And you could see they identified, by the way, this tree is wrong, Latimeria and uh, um, lungfishes should not be a clade. But the point is there are also identifying clades that have lower than expected diversity relative to the background of all jawed vertebrates in this example. So <clears throat> when we apply this to our time calibrated phylogeny, so now I'm showing you the time calibrated phylogeny drawn as a circle phylogeny where the divergence time is shown here on this, on this axis. And I've color coded where we find our significant shifts of lineage diversification. So relative to the background rate of the inclusive phylogeny, we see eight shifts in lineage diversification rate among the acanthomorphs. And it's color-coded, as I said. All of the shifts are within the percomorpha, okay? So all the shifts we see within acanthomorphs are in the percomorphs. And five of these lineages exhibit exceptionally high lineage diversification rates. Now, if you haven't read the paper, I'm going to ask you, does anyone want to take a guess at what some of the high diversification rate clades are? Sven, Kulander, you're here. What, do, what would you say is a high diversification rate clade of percomorphs? Um, cichlids. cichlids, yes. That, that is one of them. So cichlids was our, our positive test control in that if cichlids didn't come out as a high diversification rate clade, there was something wrong with our approach. And in fact, what we found, the five clades, uh, what is this, this new clade that's emerged of tuna and their allies, the gobies, which are species-rich, small-bodied fishes typically that do everything in marine habitats and even a number of freshwater habitats, the blennies, uh, another small-bodied clade of uh, mostly tropical nearshore percomorphs, uh, ubiquitous in all of the nearshore shallow water habitats within the tropics. Uh, the Afro-American cichlids, so cichlids actually contain several major lineages, and the most species-rich clade is the common ancestor between the neotropical cichlids and the African cichlids. That's where we detected the shift. Uh, does not involve the Madagascar and the Indian cichlids. And then snailfishes. Uh, it's okay if you've never heard of what snailfishes are. They're really kind of a bizarre and enigmatic clade of teleost. Uh, they have an anti-tropical distribution. I only know them because we encounter them in the Southern Ocean when we're fishing for notathenioids. And what I'm showing you here is the diversification rate estimate for all of these major clades and the high, five high diversification rate clades are shown in the blue box. So here we have basically uh, the tunas and their allies, gobies, the blennioids, cichlids and snailfishes. And even though the posterior estimates on those diversification rates estimate, the snailfish rate is actually higher than the cichlid rate. So this was a really interesting, unexpected result. And what I hope this does, this really starts getting people looking at snailfishes uh, from a different perspective, and in fact, potentially studying them in the context of adaptive radiation. Now, what's interesting about this result, specifically to me, is that when we think about where percomorphs have diversified, we often invoke coral reefs as being these important habitats of 
high rates of lineage diversification. And what we're showing you here is that basically really only two of these clades could be called reef clades. And I wouldn't call blennies or gobies as obligatory reef clades, like I would think more of like wrasses and butterfly fishes, right? And what we see is if you look, we have open ocean, we reef, shallow, near shore clades, we have freshwater, and we have cold temperate and even polar conditions. So what we argue is that what makes acanthomorphs and percomorphs so exceptional and what probably gener helps generate their, their, the incredible species richness we see is that they're so versatile. They really are, as a clade, a jack of all trades and a master of all trades. Whereas we see these species-rich lineages with high rates of lineage diversification that are exploiting essentially the entire range of aquatic and marine habitats that are available. Now, I'll round out by talking a little bit about phylogenomic, phylogenomic approaches to phylogeny inference. Now, we've experimented with a number of approaches in our lab. We've done anchored hybrid enrichment approaches developed by Alan and Emily Lemon. That takes uh, a panel of 350 loci, uh, of which a probe set is designed to then capture those loci from whole uh, genomic DNA that's sheared. Then those probes are made, generated, at the genomic libraries that are generated are then directly sequenced utilizing next generation sequencing approaches. And we're also experimenting with ultra-conserved elements. Essentially, methodologically, it's, it's the same as the anchored hybrid enrichment, but here, the regions of the genome that are targeted are these ultra-conserved elements that are present across animal genomes. So the probes are targeting these ultra-conserved elements, and what you're doing is you're generating the sequence data on either side of those ultra-conserved elements. <clears throat> now, the, the power of this approach is that you can obtain data sets for loci uh, fairly easily that range from about 750 to 1,500 loci, and the length of each locus can range between 300 to about 1,100 base pairs. So pretty quickly, you could start building these really large multi-locus data sets. And uh, this method, in terms of its application to phylogenetics, was really developed uh, by Brant Faircloth, and here's a really informative paper published in 2012 that kind of outlines the UCE approach. And working with Mike Alfaro, Brant Faircloth, Matt Friedman, Peter Wainwright, what we've been able to do is generate a preliminary phylogeny of acanthomorph telios using 924 of these ultra-conserved loci. We have a 70% complete uh, data matrix, and essentially what we're finding are phylogenies that look a lot like those we're inferring from our smaller molecular data sets. The difference is, for some hard phylogenetic problems, we're getting dramatically uh, larger levels of support. So, for example, uh, there are morphologists out there, ichthyological morphologists, who really love to uh, criticize and assault molecular approaches to phylogeny inference. And one of the uh, results that they love to talk about is the fact that typically if you do a molecular phylogeny, you will not resolve the pleuronectiforms, the flatfishes, as a clade. And what I'm showing you here is a sketched phylogeny where the red branches in each case are pleuronectiform lineages. Now, when you do this, the pleuronectiforms resolve in the same clade, and they're usually separated by one or two nodes that are weakly supported with really short branches, and you almost, you, you essentially cannot reject pleuronor, pleuroform, pleuronectiform monophyly. However, uh, Cetodes, which is the sister lineage to all of the pleuronectiforms, uh, rarely is resolved as a sister lineage to the rest of the pleuronectiforms in these molecular phylogenies. Now, I think of this as just a hard phylogenetic problem in that if you have rapid lineage diversification over a short period of time, it's really difficult to find these molecular characters that will resolve those relationships. In a sense, it's a real, what we call a real hard, as opposed to a soft polytomy. So what we've done is we said, okay, well, let's try the ultra-conserved element data set. And this is a paper we just submitted uh, last Wednesday. And what I'm showing you here 
is basically a phylogeny of several Karangamorph lineages uh, inferred from these ultra-conserved elements. And here in red are all the pleuronectiforms that include Cetodes resolved with high bootstrap support as the sister lineage of all the other pleuronectiforms. So now pleuronectiforms are indeed resolving as a clade. And the point here is that while the phylogenies we'll infer will be fairly similar to the phylogenies we're inferring from much smaller data sets, the point here is it seems that, you know, by overpowering that hard polytomy with a lot of data, that indeed we have the potential to resolve some of the most difficult phylogenetic problems in the tree of life. <clears throat> so the direction we're going now is basically how do we marry these phylogenies we're inferring with the incredible information that's available on fishes on the database such as FishBase. So we're taking kind of a next generation uh, informatic approach. That is what we want to do is we want a phylogeny that includes all 18,000 acanthomorph species. And the strategy we're proposing to do that is to genotype 6,000 acanthomorph species utilizing these ultra-conserved elements. This is what we would call our high-confidence phylogeny. Utilize information from GenBank to add a bunch of other species. This is what we would call our moderate-confidence phylogeny layer and then generate a provisional phylogeny layer, the lineage is in gray here, where there is no phylogenetic data available whatsoever. There's no information on GenBank, there's no morphological phylogenetic information, but where we're putting these, these tax into the phylogeny based solely on taxonomic hypotheses. Now, that becomes a little shaky, but the advantage of this is at least tells us what are the lineages we don't have sampled yet. And where are those lineages? Uh, where do they occur? And then we could uh, mirror or marry the phylogenies we're generating from this information with information on fish base. So here's an example we worked up with Dan Rabowski. All of this geographic information was taken from GBIF and fish base. And what we're showing you here is here is our mega tree analysis of uh, the Canthomorph teleost. The red branches are showing high lineage diversification, blue branches are showing low lineages of diversification, and we're plotting this based on the latitude that those species occur. And so what we're seeing is that some of the high lineage diversification rate clades of Acanthomorph teleos actually occur at high latitudes. And as you get to the tropics, it's really just kind of a ho-hum lineage diversification rate, really nothing special, not low, not high, just kind of like the Goldilocks zone, just right. So what we're proposing is that kind of taking these informatic rich data layers and combining them with phylogenetic trees, we'll be able to come up with some fairly general observations about the evolutionary history of species-rich clades like Percomorph teleost. <clears throat> so what I've tried today, to do today is kind of introduce you to the acanthomorphs and introduce you to kind of these burgeoning uh, efforts to infer their phylogeny in the earliest part of the 21st century. And what is this doing? This is doing fundamental things like biodiversity discovery. We're discovering new clades, and often we're actually discovering new species with like our work in Antarctica and in Eastern North America. We're discovering unknown evolutionary radiations, such as the snail fishes, and we're actually able to uh, understand aspects of functional morphological diversification, lineage and habitat diversification, and really show how phylogenomic approaches will help us understand, uh, resolve the tree of life. So I want to thank funding agencies and a number of collaborators, uh, but most importantly, I'd like to thank Fishbase, uh, wonderful city of Stockholm, the, the great country of Sweden, uh, Michael Noren and Bodell for all of their help in getting me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. We have time for one or two very quick questions before lunch. Who would like to start? No hands, only hungry stomachs. Here we have one here. Yeah. So when you were from um, using a few 
uh, genes, like 10 genes as before, but a lot of species. And then you change to including much more genes and less species. Then essentially the results are the same, are consistent. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So with regard, the question, right. So as we, we go from adding more data, where even though we have fewer species, kind of at the deeper parts of the tree that would be sampled with the fewer species, we are seeing essentially the same results we get with the 10 genes. So the question then is why do the big data sets, which uh, uh, I ask that all the time. And I've been, a, I'm not really a critic, but I've been skeptical about utilizing the big data set for like all of the acanthomorph species. But this example where we're able to now resolve monophyly of the flatfishes, which is an expected result, is, is to me becoming more convincing of the power of that. And uh, in, the, in the graphic that you showed the diversification rate, <clears throat> I think that you showed that the Persiformes were a low rate. I thought that was a high rate in the Persiformes. Right, well, Percomorphs you mean? So Persiformes are, uh, are going by the wayside. So the Percomorpha is the large inclusive clade. There's a clade we do call Persiformes now, but it's much more exclusive. It contains the Percidae, the Notothenioids, and everything we used to call the scombromor Scombroforms. I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, Scorpaniforms. Um, but Percomorphs overall have a low rate, but there are, there are clades within Percomorphs that have high rates, like the Blennies, the Gobies, and the Cichlids, and the Snailfishes. Let me ask then finally, which are your favorite genes that give uh, generally the most robust phylogenies? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, what we're finding is it's often hard to predict just based on the rate of substitution of the gene, like where in the phylogeny it will actually provide resolution. And what we're finding also is that across these 10 genes, they vary in rate quite a bit across different fish lineages, but a gene that has, say, a high or a moderate rate will also have a higher or a moderate rate regardless of what clade we're looking at. So I don't necessarily have a favorite, but I would say that if you're interested in including species into kind of a phylogenetic perspective and you're thinking of using nuclear genes, I would recommend using the panel of 10 genes we used. Because not only are we showing that it provides resolution among all major lineages, I didn't talk about today, it also provides resolution among very closely related species. And also, all of that information is available on GenBank, the alignments are available on Dryad, so you could go in and to your favorite group of fish, sequence these genes, and immediately have this deep background of which to integrate your data. So can I say that each uh, time perspective has its own favorite gene, in a way? Yes. Depending it, yeah, on the time it, range. Well, actually, no, because even genes that have a high rate of substitution may provide information for deep time, and even genes that have a slow rate substitution, you know, sometimes you get lucky in Las Vegas, right? And even a gene that has a slow rate of substitution may actually have a substitution at a fairly, uh, that would allow you to characterize a fairly young clade. So it's a probability distribution, but what we're finding is that all 10 of them seem to be working together to provide resolution at various parts of the phylogeny. On this roulette wheel, you are one of the winners. Here's the present. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.